Okay, so this is, we call this the complementary DNA. cDNA, complementary DNA. So if we look over here, T and A bond to each other. So I'm going to write an A under here and an A under there. And then this is a G, C. Okay, you finish it out. I'll give you a little bit of time to practice that. And then I'll come along and write the answer and you can check yourself. Is that good? Yep. Clear? Okay. All right. So now let's make an mRNA. Messenger RNA. There's actually three types of RNA. Okay. And the messenger RNA is the one that's going to copy this template strand up here, which is the red one. It's going to copy that template strand, and then it'll actually leave the nucleus. Well, it doesn't have to, but most often it will leave the nucleus and go out and attach to a ribosome out in the cytoplasm, and that's where the protein is going to be assembled. Now, there are ribosomes in the nucleus to make proteins that are needed in the nucleus, um, like the enzymes that are needed right here for this process. There's a lot of enzymes that are involved in making these copies, um, making the uh, uh, mRNA transcription. And so that's going to, those proteins are going to be needed right there in the nucleus. So they're going to be made there and stay there. So some mRNA might stay in the nucleus and attach to a ribosome in the nucleus. But the most commonly, we talk about it leaving through a nuclear pore. Remember, I've talked about that, I think, and going out and attaching to a ribosomal, a cytoplasmic ribosome. Okay, so here, let me go over here underneath my, uh, if I can get my pen lined up. This little write pad's fun, but at the same time, sometimes the calibration of it's a little strange. Getting used to it's strange. Okay, so uracil, okay, it's going to replace thymine, right? So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to put a U here instead of a T. So G still bonds to C. That never changes. That's true for both, in both nucleic acids, but in RNA, U bonds to A instead of T. So now the hard part on this one, um, if and, and this probably won't be much of a problem with you on a test because you've got multiple choice and the question changes. So I have to rewrite the question or you know change the template, change the DNA even. I probably will. But on a short answer test in a normal semester where you're writing this down on a sheet of paper, um, I'll this this right here will be your first question. Do this, and then I'll ask. Okay, now make the mRNA strand. And you have to look through the cDNA copy the complementary DNA you just made, you don't want to refer to the green. You have to go back to the template. You have to go back to that red one to get your, to make your copy from, to make your, this is your transcription from. Okay, so T would still read as an A, okay, because A is not replaced, only T is replaced. So a T is still going to tell us that we need an A here. All right, and C to G like normal, G to C like normal. Okay, go ahead and finish that one out for practice.
It's like I wrote smaller, so I got that all kind of scattered out. I don't think I skipped anything, though. Make sure I didn't put an accidental mutation in there somewhere. Which, if I did, it would be a great illustration for later, but... <laughs> Might be a little confusing at the moment. Okay. Do you have it? Is it good? So now what we're going to do is we're going to trans translate. Okay, we transcribed and now we're translating uh, this mRNA into amino acids. So every three bases of mRNA is what's called a codon. And I was taught to bracket them this way. I've seen some textbooks will have students or workbooks, whatever, have students just put slashes in between them. I don't really care what you do. Just make sure you, you section off every three, because if you don't, you'll make an error um, because you'll, you'll do what I did here and open extra space and you'll go, okay, I've got these three fine. And then, and then you'll like skip that one and come over and, and do the next three or something like that. Okay. It, it just, it's really easy to skip a base or um, uh, read a base twice. Okay, uh, in between, okay, because you look away to write your amino acid down and then you look back up and you start at the wrong place. All right, and, and that's a um, that's a frame shift mutation and we don't want to do that. It'll cost you points on the test, <laughs> okay. All right, so um, uh, bracket it some way. That this, I think, I don't know if this bracketing is the old fashioned way of doing it or not. All the geneticists I know do that and that's how I was taught to do it. So that's how I do it. But um, any, any way that works for you, as long as you section them off so it's easily seen by you, what you're working with, okay? Um, let's see, I need another color. What do I want to use? Okay, so, um, oh, I know what I, I need to write that word out for you because I think it's in your notes somewhere, but let's, these three bases, every three bases is called a codon. Okay. So that's the word, codon. Okay. Okay, then I'm going to leave this screen for a little bit, go back to the PowerPoint presentation. I'll come back to the screen. Um, actually, I need to really quick here copy down, copy down that sequence because I won't be able to see the screen once I leave it. Hopefully, I mean, you've got it on a piece of paper, so you'll be able to see it. Okay, um, let me. And about the wrong direction. So um, this is in your book. A student told me last hour it was 127. It's on 127 in your book. So if you didn't know that already, this is where you should find a table that looks like this. Maybe exactly like it. It is Pearson, the same publication. But this came out of a different textbook. So <clears throat> it might be slightly different in ours. Same publisher, but different book. OK. So, um, so we're going to look at that first codon. That first codon is. AAG, and this is set up first bases on this side, second bases on that side, and third bases on this side. Sounds like you're playing a baseball game, except the bases are going the opposite direction. Okay, all right, so first base, these are the bases here. So we look at first base is A. So that means that the amino acid we're looking for is somewhere in this block of rows right here. Okay, all right, A. And then the second base is an A. So if we come over here, here's A. So that means it's in this column. 
okay, well, we know if it's this block of rows in this column, then that's this block right here. Our amino acid we're looking for is in this block. And at that point, I usually don't even mess with looking over here at the third base and drawing my coordinate out because uh, I just go down the row. <laughs> okay, but actually, to be technically correct, you come over here and you find the G and come across to that block, and there you are. AAG would give us the amino acid lysine. Okay, so these are abbreviations, and I'm not going to ask you to memorize what amino acids go with what abbreviation. Um, I think for the most part, you look at them and you have your, if, if the table I give you on the test has abbreviations and the answer has them written out fully, I, I think usually it's pretty obvious. You know, I don't, I'm not going to put asparagine and arginine as, as alternate wrong answers. It'll be something more obvious. If the answer is supposed to be arginine, I'll have phenylalanine stuck in there, okay, in that spot. So uh, I don't try to trick you on that. Um, I believe on all previous tests, um, I have tried at least to make sure that if the table I use has the abbreviations, then actually that's what I'm using in the answer. Um, I think the tables I use are different from this and that I think they have, the, have it all written out, okay? Um, and then it's written out in the answer. Um, but if I don't, like I said, I've, I always, in the past, I've also tried to make sure that I didn't, you know, I didn't start the wrong answer with the same answer, the same letter as the right answer. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> somewhere in there. Um, so then the next one is going to be CGU. So here's our C, go across the top, here's our G, come down to that row, right here's our block, CGU will be arginine, speaking of arginine. Okay, now you do the other two on your own. And I'll give you the answer soon a little bit so you can check yourself. Ah, that's going to give me an opportunity to talk about something that I forgot to talk about with 10 o'clock. Stop and start codons. So if I give you a sequence like this, um, and you won't probably won't have any instance this semester where you're going to run into this, because this is, again, something that would be on a short answer test that in a class you would be writing out on a piece of paper, uh, which is normally how I do this. This is like one page, a series of, of I don't know, probably about 15 points of short answer is just this, here's your DNA template, make a complementary strand. Now make an mRNA strand. Now make a protein, or you know, make the amino acid sequence. Um, and so what happens is sometimes if I haven't checked my strand because I wrote it in a hurry, you'll have what happened just now, okay? You probably wound up with a stop codon in the middle of that somewhere, didn't you? And students will sometimes, and I always tell them every semester, I said, just decode it, <laughs> okay? Whatever it says, write it down. You're not actually the enzyme making the protein. So don't follow the instructions of the code, just decode. And but students will get to the stop. And sometimes on tests, I'll, I'll make these a little bit longer. They'll have actually, I'll have about eight amino acids that you have to uh, decode, okay? Um, so that's, uh, there's about 24 nucleotides in the, uh, on the short answer version. I think I'm a little bit shorter. I think I usually do more like about, yeah, like maybe like 14, let's see, 15, okay, 12, this is 12, so yeah, 15 or 18 on a, on the short answer multiple choice, I mean, yeah, on the, on the digital, okay, but anyway, um, it's usually 24 on the, <clears throat> on the handwritten version, uh, so they get in there somewhere about, you know, amino acid, yeah, three, four, five, somewhere in there like we are, and they hit stop, and they just stop, they don't decode the rest of it, well, they lose half their points that way, Okay, so don't do that. Um, you just decode it. So if it says stop, write stop, and then go on to the next one. Um, start is a little bit tricky down here too. If you find AUG, and I have that as the very first, if that is the very first code on up, then you write start. Because that's actually what happens, is that that is the codon that tells, so that the, the reading enzymes are told 
go copy this section. Here, this section. We need this section. Well, where in this section do I start? Well, they go along until they find this AUG, and it's like, ah, here's where I start. Okay, because it's roughly this section, but you may a few bases there at the beginning. Yeah, okay. So they hit that AUG, that's where they start. And then they're going to copy until uh, the region ends, basically. Okay. So any other AUGs that they come across after that first one is not a start codon anymore. Okay. It's methionine. So AUG is only interpreted as start at the beginning. And after that, it's going to be written as methionine. So again, make sure you know that. Um, don't write start in the middle of a strand. You can write stop in the middle of a strand, but don't ever write start in the middle of a strand. And also don't put methionine at the beginning because it's not. At the beginning, it's start. Okay, so that's a trickier one, really. Okay, because uh, it can code for two things, uh, but it really, it's contextual. It only codes for one. Just depends on where it's at as to which one it's coding for. Okay. All right, makes sense. Let's uh, go back and take a look at the uh, little whiteboard here and see if y'all got your amino you know, acids right. Okay, so this first one here is going to be lysine. Whoops, I spelled, yeah, I spelled it right. I thought I left out letter. Okay. And we usually do put this little dash in between them. That is a peptide bond. That's what that represents. Between two amino acids, you have a peptide bond. Okay. Um, peptide, remember, peptide is another name for a protein. Polypeptide is a protein. Okay. Um, okay, so that's lysine. Now we have arginine. And then next is our stop codon. We're just going to write it and go on. Okay, and then the next one is alanine. And I really try to make sure those stop protein pro codons don't happen in the middle of a sequence like that. But it depends if I'm modifying the test, you know, changing it around a little bit, and I do it in a hurry, and I don't double check myself. Um, I have made that mistake a few times and not, not caught it because I didn't go back and double check myself. I was like, I didn't intend that. Okay. All right. Did you get that? Yes. Okay, good. Making sense to everybody? Yes. Are we going to have to spell the whole word out or just abbreviate it? Um, yeah, you can just kind of copy whatever's on the, on the table that I give you. If I give you abbreviations, you can use abbreviations. If I give you the whole word, you can use the whole word so you don't have to worry about learning to spell it. Okay. Okay. And again, this won't won't be short answer. Most likely, we're not going to have short answer on any of the tests. It's all multiple choice, so you can you can pick it, <laughs> pick the right one, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 In a normal semester, that could be a little more difficult because I'd have you handwriting everything out. Yeah. Okay. All right. And of course, I keep saying normal semester, and I think this is the new normal. <laughs> everything. This is the way we're going to be teaching from now on. Honestly. Um, which is okay with me. Uh, I'm just gonna have to change my language a little bit <laughs> and and adapt. Commit to the fact that I'm adapting uh, to digital probably uh, for everything instead of, well, I might go back to this someday type of thing. All right, so um, this is where we this is where we were then. okay. So where I want to be and where we are and what is our time? OK, we're not bad. OK, so this got us to um, this point where we have made our, our polypeptide down here now. And all of this basically now just kind of describes what I have shown you um, in more detail than I really care for you to know overall. I don't go into the elongation and the termination stuff. Um, It'd be great, but time. We have a lot of stuff this class is supposed to cover. It's supposed to be a big overview class. Um, we're really supposed to get into populations and ecosystems more. Um, but then once you have this understanding of basics too, uh, this is supposed to be review. <laughs> the review from high school, but it never is because everybody has usually forgotten um, forgotten what they've learned um, along these lines. So transfer RNA. 
um, which is referred to as tRNA. So we have three types of RNA. We have messenger RNA, we have tRNA, and we have rRNA. Okay, let me back up here to the slide right here. So when we have these, oh, well, I wonder if I've got the other slide in there that shows this. Um, when we have these amino acids being brought up to this codon to say, hey, this is what's supposed to go here, uh, there's a little anti-codon is what it's called. It's a three base, and it's just three bases. It's not a long strand like this. It's just a little three bases that kind of float around out in your, um, in your cytoplasm, and they they come up and they read, read this and say, oh, hey, um, and it's going to be UAC is that anti-codon, and uh, it's going to be be right here, okay, UAC, uh, and it it goes and catches the methionine, okay, because these nucleic nucleotides have been made in your in your cell, they're there or um, broken down out of food you've eaten, they're in they've been transported to the cell, they're made or transported, so. Uh, that tRNA is going to find this methionine. And actually, it's what brings it up here, and, and it the tRNA bonds to the RNA, putting the methionine in place. Okay. Then uh, another tRNA is going to go get lysine, bring it up here, and hold it. And they hold it there. They hold these amino acids in place until that peptide bond is formed. Okay. And then they go away. They go down and find where they're needed again to go get another of the same amino acid to go in a different spot. Okay. So uh, that's the tRNA. The rRNA is actually a subunit of the ribosome. The ribosome is an organelle that's a non-membrane bound organelle. It's the only non-membrane bound organelle found in a cell. And it's made up of a small piece of RNA and a protein. Those are the two subunits of it. And so uh, very small, very tiny. And that is your, um, your ribosomal RNA is what the R stands for. And it's just a it. Well, it bonds to the very end. It bonds to the start codon. That's what it does. The start codon actually um, comes down, binds. You know, I said this is methionine, but it, yeah, it's either methionine or a start codon. This, this, this is kind of a deceptive drawing here. This start codon is actually going to bind to that ribosomal RNA so that it holds this whole thing in place at the ribosome, so it can. It can start, and then it slides. The ribosome will slide um, along, like a, like a reader almost. Um, so the methionine actually wouldn't be here. The first thing in the sequence would be lysine in this case. Hold on a second. I've got a question. <laughs> Sorry, I have a. Uh, we haven't had warm water in our shower for. Oh, we've had warm. We've had warm, lukewarm. We have not had a hot, hot water in our shower for over a year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and right now it's flat out cold to take a shower. So we actually have a plumber who made it out today on the roads and uh, uh, is here trying to get something fixed. And he's going to have to change the way our shower head is in our shower. And so my husband is here because he's teaching at home too, but he's in between classes. And he's like, how do you want it? And I'm like, I can't visualize it. I don't know what you're talking about. Just make it look good. So, <laughs> all right. Oh goodness, what happened? Okay. So anyway, uh, yeah, this would be the first, the first in the sequence. But anyway, so that's how the ribosomal RNA functions. And so those are your three types and uh, and what they do in this process. Okay. Um, so that was our tRNA slide there that talked about that. I don't think I talk about ribosomal RNA here at all, but it will be mentioned again when we get into organelles because it is part of the ribosome, which is an organelle of the cell. So kind of hold on to that idea. Okay. Um, for the future, it alludes to it here. Two subunits of a ribosome. Yeah, well, one of those subunits is the is the R RNA. Okay. Um, again, uh, knowing these five stages is not important. What we talked about was 
one to you and basically three the initiation of it and then we just kind of skipped to this and said well it's going to terminate at some point so don't worry about it all right so here's mutations so kind of the point i wanted to get through today is mutations excuse me <clears throat> So we're reading along in a protein sequence, and this is just right somewhere in this protein sequence. It's a really long thing. It's not just these three three amino acids. It's much, much bigger than that. But we're just going to look at the section, the segment here of our of our protein. And this is uh, the protein, that, or yeah, the code for the hemoglobin, okay, uh, which is the component of our red blood cell that carries oxygen. And it uh, this gene here determines the shape of the red blood cell, okay. And so uh, this is this is a section here where this should be the normal sequence, but we have a mutation that occurs in humans. It's a genetically inherited mutation. Now that um, changes right here is this middle middle codon. I'm sorry, the middle base of the codon becomes an A instead of a T. And normally, when this type of, of mutation happens, this is called a base substitution. And when this type of mutation happens, it usually makes the protein totally non-functioning. It's going to result in some type of uh, um, inability to do something, you know, metabolize something, build something, break something down, whatever. Uh, so more often than not, when any type of mutation happens, you wind up with an organism that isn't able to live. Okay. So if this uh, if this were to happen in, in a human normally, uh, or I mean, I shouldn't say normally because this is this is normal in a sense, but a mutation like this happening in a human would usually result in like the fetus not developing, developing partly and resulting in a miscarriage or natural abortion is a scientific term for it, um, or uh, uh, stillborn. Okay, uh, the fetus develops full enough to term but then doesn't survive. It's usually some type of um, of genetic mutation that happened that interfered somewhere along the way uh, with uh, some type of protein uh, production that messed things up, okay, made the organism not viable. And there's other causes for those types of things to happen as well, but um, this you know, mutations usually result in, in something like that as well, okay. Um, so here's one though that isn't lethal. So as others are referred to as lethal mutations, and lethal mutations are the most common mutation. This one's not lethal, and uh, this results in a, in a mutant hemoglobin, which results in the change of the red blood cell shape. And the change, uh, instead of being red blood cells are shaped kind of like donuts that have a depressed center, but the hole isn't totally pressed out. Um, or maybe if you're familiar with what they look like, those uh, like ski inner tubes, Okay, have the flat spot in the middle for you to sit in. That's kind of what a red blood cell looks like and what we consider the normal sense. Uh, the, these are referred to as sickle cell, and that's because the it looks like the, the circle got folded over, almost like, like an omelet, okay, into kind of a half circle, except it's not really a half circle. It's more like a um, kind of a, it's more of a half moon, less than a half moon, sickle shape, okay, crescent moon, crescent moon. Um, but that's where the term sickle comes in, okay. Uh, it has little points on the edge, edges, the ends, make little points, that crescent moon, um, and they can catch on each other. They can catch on other things, and that's why individuals who produce this are um, at a disadvantage when they reach midlife because um, that's the time when we get really stressed. We tend to have more um, arterial plaques starting to build up. Arteriosclerosis, arteriosclerosis becomes a health issue, and if you've got something extra floating around in your bloodstream to catch on on the plaque that's building up anyway and add to it it's just more problem and so that's what happens is these individuals are more prone to die of blockages um, uh, earlier starting right in the 40s 45 to 50 uh, than a person who doesn't have that okay but this is also a survival advantage because this particular type of red blood cell gives an advantage to uh, gives an ability for a person to uh, be resistant to um, malaria, okay. Uh, the malaria type that's carried by the Anopheles mosquito, uh, it's actually carried by the Plasmodium vivax. We'll get into that later in class. Um, there's a lab that you do that discusses that on genetics, because this is a genetic, is that inherit, inherited genetic trait. Um, and it's also, uh, well, I don't know. We've missed a whole week of school. So I, sometimes I kind of gloss over this. Since it's covered in lab, I don't talk about it much in class. But I actually do like to talk about this in class as far as um, 
uh, with the little with the parasite that carries it, the plasmodium vivax and things like that. So we'll possibly have more on that in the future. But it's just a single amino acid. Uh, we get valine substituting for um, glucine, and that uh, you know changes changes everything, but doesn't make this protein completely non-functioning, which is normal. It's normal that the protein would not be able to function. So this is rare, okay, that something like this actually happens. So this slide here is, is words for the next slide I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so you can go back and read that if you want. I'm gonna say it here with different words. All right, so here is a uh, example of a, of a different a normal gene. We've got our mRNA here coding for these amino acids. Okay, so here's an example, another example of a base substitution in addition to the one I just showed you. Let's see, notice here that everything is the same through phenylalanine, but right here we we have substituted an A for a G. Okay, see everything after that's the same as well, but now we have A or G. So that's going to change that amino acid to serine, but it doesn't change anything after that. So this is just a simple base substitution. Can still result in an entirely non-functioning protein, but it might not. Depends. This last one down here, this is called a base deletion. And what we've done is notice these three U's in a row for phenylalanine. Somehow or another in our copying, our mRNA, we, we skipped one, okay? And this is what I was saying. This is why it's best to, to bracket them off or to put slashes or something for every three bases on your codon, because this is an easy one to do on the test, okay? It's an easy one to do or quiz. It's easy to, to get their reading and, and skip one if you don't write that. Um, and I do expect you to use scrap paper on these. Uh, I know if I'm using Respond to Select Down Browser, it'll flag you because you've looked down for the screen and stuff like that. So. Um, probably what you want to do when you're taking these quizzes that have you where you need scrap paper for these genetics things, and later you'll have pennant squares, so it'll be an issue too, is to um, you know, like hold your paper up to the camera <laughs> and then and then put it down. And I know you know I know what you're doing then, and you can hold it back up when you get done, so I know you're finished, you know, because uh, it'll flag it, and and I'll go in and look. But I can also double check too. Um, Canvas also tells me exactly what time you open up the question to look at it, how long you look at it, and then we you know when you open the next question, it, it, it logs every single action you make, okay, on that, um, on your quizzes. And that's not Respondus, that's Canvas. I think Respondus does it too, but it's like if it flags me at a moment and you're on this question, then I kind of know what you're doing, okay. But showing me the paper also makes it faster for me. I don't have to cross-reference. So that's how we'll handle that because I, I expect you to need scrap paper for these questions and definitely for pennant squares when we get into genetics, okay. So um, this is going to be uh, where everything gets shifted over. Um, and since I'm looking this way, it's probably opposite of how you're seeing it. But anyway, you can see that really what's going on here is that this um, this G up here that was the first for glycine is now the last for this base sequence here, this, this codon. And that's going to change it from being phenylalanine to being leucine. And now the second G of what was glycine is now the first base for the next codon. So now everything is shifted. So GCG is going to be alanine and CAU is going to be histidine. So we've got everything after that deletion is now changed. So this is going to be an entirely different protein, not even resembling the original protein. Uh, here we resemble that just one amino acid difference, but this is everything's different from that point on. Again, usually this is this is going to be a mess. Nothing nothing useful comes out of this at all. Uh, but then again, you know, there's that rare rare thing where this might actually be something useful. Probably not at all for what the cell was intending at that time, but it could be a protein that actually does something else that you know, kind of unexpected. We can have the opposite of this occur as well. We can have a base insertion. Okay, so let's go back up here to our original template at the top. Um, we can pick down that same location because it's easy to see those three U's in a row. So we come in here and let's stick a let's stick a C in here. Okay, now that shifts everything over the other way. So now this would read CGG instead of GGC. Okay, and uh, so 
um, you know, have to look on your chart and see what that is, um, what CGG would be. I don't think we've got that on the on there anywhere, but um, that will stick a different amino acid in this location, and it would also result in the next amino acid potentially being different. Now, if you if you look at that, CGG, CGC. Yeah, I think CGC actually codes for alanine, oddly enough. <laughs> okay, but then your next one on down is going to start with an A instead of yeah, and it's still going to, it's still going to, it's going to mess up. Okay, from there on out. Uh, so insertions and deletions typically do that. They, um, from that point on, nothing is the same. Whereas the base substitution, just that one amino acid is affected. Does that make sense? People good with that? Okay, so this is um, just checking my time. There we go. Okay, looking for my phone. I'm over time. So this is where we'll end and pick up on Monday. Okay, guess I'll see you rain, snow, or shine in Zoom. Have a safe weekend and stay warm. Hey, Professor.